let us know how femtosecond lasers can, are applicable and what we can do with them in anterior segment surgery. Great, Kasim. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for getting up early, so early in the morning, everyone. So I'm just going to share my slide here. Okay, great. Okay, is that okay? The first slide's on. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay, all right, great. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to talk about, so in case you want me to talk about um, femtosecond laser application in anterior segment surgery, these are my uh, disclosures. I mean, I do give talks for when we were one of the first units to do um, small surgery that you will see basically uh, for car size Meditech back in 2012. And I also do, do give lectures for Zima with one of the femtosecond lasers that you will basically um, also uh, see some work that we've been doing with them recently as well. So generally, we all have a big fascination with lasers, and this is a this is a laser um, uh, show. This is Marina Bay Sands. This is in Singapore. This is one of the biggest casinos um, that they basically built over here by Sands of the Sahara Group. And every night at nine o'clock, uh, you know, subject to now the COVID thing, um, is basically stopped. You used to get this laser light show. You can sit down over here and have dinner and go over the water, and also at the top of the building as well. And of course, as you all know, lasers per se is an acronym for line to amplification by stimulation of emission of radiations. And, you know, we have a big fascination with lasers. The largest laser you already probably would have heard of is the Large um, Hadron Collider. And, and a few years back, we had an exhibition um, in Singapore um, showing um, artifacts from the Large Hadron Collider. So I went to see this in the Science Museum and I thought one of the funny things was a little sign basically over here saying uh, big scary laser do not look into the beam uh, with remaining eye so with the lasers off this have this charm where you can be used for entertainment but also a little bit of basically fear and we also know of course that through growing up there's good lasers and there's basically bad lasers and we've basically all been brought up in the era of basically star wars so we basically uh, you know grown up with laser technology as well and lasers are used throughout medicine in multiple fields in dermatology um, in oncology in neurosurgery in angioplasty, orthopedics, gastro, ENT, but probably ophthalmology actually uses lasers more than any other subspeciality in medicine. And this is whether you're doing refractive, retina, glaucoma, oculoplastics, pediatrics, and of course for cataract as well now. And we'll talk a little bit more about the uses of these lasers in the, for cataract and refractive surgery based later on. And what you'll see is from this table on this side over here is that the interaction between the laser per se and the tissue will give you a different effect. So of course, if you want a photocoagulation effect, you need to use a different laser. If you want a photothermal effect, you want to use a different laser. If you want a basically photodisruptive effect, you need to use a different laser. So it's important to understand which laser you're basically using and what kind of effect you're basically trying to aim to basically achieve. So these are some of the reactions that we see basically as corneal surgeons or anterior segment surgeons to photochemical is of course what we see with uh, cross-linking. Photothermal is typically what you see with an argon laser. Photoablation is typically a UV laser that you'll basically see for excimer ablation. Uh, Photoinduced, plasma-induced photoablation is typically what you see with an iridium YAG laser when you're doing capsulotomy. And uh, photodisruption is a slightly higher, faster form of basically photoablation, which is what we see basically in femtosecond lasers. And they all generate and they work slightly differently. And that's why you basically get a different frequency with respect to heat formation when you used to talk about retinal lasers or they're more light absorbing compared to bubble forming lasers such as the photodestructive effect because you get basically mechanical shock waves giving you cavitation bubbles and jetting. So this basically highlights that difference itself. So you can see from over here from the visible spectrum where you have a visible wavelength of light basically over in the middle. A lot of the lasers such as the femtosecond laser lies in this range over here, the infrared. You all know obviously the excimer laser is UV laser, so 193. So of course this will affect the penetration of the laser beam as well. Okay, one of the key things about the photoablation systems so such an excimer laser that they're very good for shaving and alterating shape but they're not very good for penetration because they have to go basically quite deep okay which you, you'll penetrate straight from the surface while infrared lasers can actually penetrate through clear tissue okay we'll show you some examples basically later on and why this makes a difference in why you use infrared lasers for certain things and why you basically use uv lasers for other things as well Speed is also basically an issue as well. And what you'll see is, is that as you go from thermal effects, which are generally slower, and you'll know this from your argon laser, when you're doing retinal PRP, or, or when they used to certainly do focal macular laser, I know most people will do injections now for everything. It's a very slow burn, while your photodisruption, say from your femtosecond laser, when you're making a laser graph, is very, very fast. 
In fact, it's so fast, it's about 10 to minus 15, and that's why, of course, it's called femtosecond uh, laser itself. So this is how fast it is. The femtosecond laser is probably the fastest pulse, uh, fastest uh, pulse width of the, or the fastest lasers. It's 10 to the minus 15. The shortest thing that can be measured is basically between two molecules, and this is an attosecond, so this is 10 to the minus 80. But generally, we're talking about femto in the 10 to the 15, and then you'll see all the way down with the laser speeds down to basically nanosecond, which is 10 to the, 10 to the minus 9 itself. And the important thing to understand is, is that there's a corollary over here between energy and time. If you have something that's extremely, extremely fast, at a relatively low energy, you can get a lot of power. And this is one of the bases on how femtosecond lasers work, because you're talking about speeds of about 10 to the minus 15. This allows you to use relatively low energy, but to get a lot of basically um, high power. And of course, this allows to basically cut the cornea as well. So femtosecond lasers really were first uh, developed in 1991 uh, by Civit et al. And what you're gonna see at the bottom over here, when I run these videos, are the first three femtosecond lasers. So you can see the 15 kilohertz, um, intralaser on the left, the 30 kilohertz in the middle, and the 60 kilohertz on the right hand side. And this is creating a LASIK trap in basically real time. And it will show you how the differences in the speed of the generation of the laser, laser traps and how slow it was with those first prototype labors back in 2003, which was the first basically commercial laser, which was running at 15 kilohertz. So it's quite clear when you see this, that speed is basically an issue. So if you can lay down those photo disruptive patterns of the lasers, but this is typically done in a raster pattern like you can see over here in this video, as they're basically spots are being laid down going across the eye as well, that sure, you, somebody is still having the LASIK trap created on the left-hand side, and of course 60 kilohertz, which is basically four times faster, is now complete. You can see speed is also an issue as well with respect to basically flat creation. So the femtosecond lasers work based on this principle of basically photo disruption. And what that means is you get something that we call laser-induced optical breakdown. So you have initial beam of pulse or laser over here fired into say a tissue or into water or something. And what happens is around that area, you get a cavitation bubble is formed. And what happens is you get an expansion and you basically then get a collapse of that bubble itself. So two of the things that you'll be familiar with using an interest, a femtosecond laser is that two things that the technician will basically tell you. One is spot and basically one is line space. You know, typically most people never change this when they're doing basically femtosecond laser flap creation as well. But you can change this and alter the energy if you're having issues with sticky flaps while you're doing the laser creation. What spot lines basically, basically means is, is the differences between the pulses as well. If you have the spots a bit closer together, what that means is you'll get a smoother resection plane, but of course it will take longer to basically form the pulses. And ideally what you want to do is have one spot with a cavitation bubble forming and another spot with another cavitation bubble forming. And so the cavitation bubbles can basically link up together. And you can see this in this nice histology picture of one of our um, uh, pulses into a human corneal stroma. You can see as we fire the laser pulse, you get a cavitation bubble around the area that's then subsequently collapsed. So what you're seeing is obviously you're not seeing the cavitation bubble per se, you're seeing the tissue collapse basically around that area. And what you see is as you fire another pulse next door to it, eventually you're gonna get a resection plane. And over here in figure D, you can see that resection plane basically over there open up quite nicely, and then you can simply lift that with a small instrument as well. The precision of the laser is quite accurate, okay? So it's down to basically one micron. Okay, so you've got very high position with the laser and it's very fast part because you're dropping basically the energy down when you're basically creating the resection plane itself. So the first uh, femtosecond lasers or the first generation that we basically say, you saw the interlays working there and it was a 15 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz. And it was quite obvious that speed was an issue because clearly you cannot have a LASIK valve that's going to take basically more than a minute and a half to be created at that level of suction. So uh, you can see with the faster lasers, the flaps were basically created earlier. The other laser that came onto the market that we were basically using as well back in 2006 was the Femtech, uh, Femtech laser. And this was basically a 10 kilohertz laser. So you can see by the speed of the laser system itself that it's quite a slow laser system. But the big difference between the two laser systems was this was a curved apinator, uh, the Femtech, versus the interlaser, which is basically a flat apinator. Now, if you look back at the early studies, this is back in 2009, this is from um, Steve Wilson's group in the States. What you will see is, is that people described when they switched to using femtosecond lasers from microkeratome that they were getting a lot of basically inflammatory cells or basically DLK. And the reason why is basically shown quite nicely in the study. And what he basically did was he basically created LASIK flaps in animal eyes and then they basically did staining with uh, looking at tunnels or looking at dead cells. And what you can see over here on this color uh, picture, and this is basically depicted in the bar chart over here on the right hand side, 
is that as the energy was basically reduced down, you can see that there are less dead cells basically over here, okay? And this is basically compared to a control one on the right-hand side, which is panel D. But it shows you over here, as you go from 2.7 microjoule energy down to basically 0.5 microjoule energy, you seem to get less basically uh, cell damage and less basically cellular apoptosis of the keratocytes in the cornea. And that explained why when people started initially using photosecond lasers, they were getting a lot of basically DLK. They'd never seen DLK with my keratome, and they were saying, why, why, why did I just spend $300,000 on this machine, and now I'm getting side effects that I never used to basically see with my, my keratome. Of course, you don't see DLK with my keratome because it's a mechanical basically cut in the cornea, while this is a pulse energy basically cut inside the cornea. And this is basically what you were basically seeing. But the other thing from this paper was interesting, was this reduction in energy, reducing the amount of inflammation. I want you to remember that because you'll see some other work that we did more recently over the last few years, showing you some advantages basically of this. The second generation was quite clear that there was a need for speed. You need to get faster lasers because that was going to reduce your time. And you saw a whole string of lasers coming out. So you have a Visumax over here, which we started using back in 2008, 2009. Uh, this interlaser is now at 60 kilohertz, and this is 200 kilohertz. You have the Technolast went from 10 to basically 40 kilohertz. And you have the Zima, which, which is an LDV system. And you'll see this works in the megahertz uh, range. Now the difference between these three lasers and this system by Zima is the way in which the pulse is basically generated. The pulse system in standard femtosecond lasers uses what we call an ampl amplification pulse to generate the laser pulse using, the, using that titanium sapphire, like I basically showed you earlier, uh, while the Zima system uses an oscillation pulse system. So that's why you can generate pulses in the megahertz system, and I'll show you some of the advantages of what's the advantage of basically being able to do that. So the laser spots are also laid down differently between the different lasers. On the um, right-hand side, you'll see the intralase, the Zima, and obviously if you're used to the Alcon system, it's the FS200. This is laid down in a raster pattern, so basically going from side to side. If you use the Femtech or the Xi system, you basically lay down as an Archimedes spiral. And you can control or you can program the laser basically to any firing pattern that you want, uh, whether you want to do it spiral, basically spiral inwards, outwards, or basically outwards in. So either centrifugal or centripetal, you can program the laser to basically fire whichever pattern that you want. That you want. But essentially, these are some of the differences between the two basically laser systems. Another big difference is suction. So how the suction is controlled with the different femtosecond lasers on the Vision Max, the suction is controlled by the machine and generally it's quite low suction. With the intralase, it's basically controlled by this suction ring on the outside over here. So you've got a suction cone over here, and you've got a suction on the surface of the eye. With the Zima, it is machine controlled as well. You'll see the suction device over here and you can alter it between 400 and up to 700 millibar depending on what surgical procedure uh, basically that you do. Typically for LASIK, they use 600 millibar for when you're using femto cataract, for example, with a ZA, and we use basically 400 millibar. So people always ask, why do you even bother switching to basically microkeratome, uh, to femtosecond lasers from basically microkeratome? I think most people now use femtosecond lasers routinely. Back in 20, 2010, 2011, there was still a lot of controversy about why should we basically bother switching because it's such an expensive bit of equipment. Three big reasons why it's basically worth switching. One is blade shatter, which you basically get with the microkeratome. And this is due to the speed of the pass of the blade across basically the surface of the cornea. The second is the flap configuration. With the femtosecond laser, you get a very planar flap. So what that means is that the central basically thickness and the peripheral basically thickness of the flap are almost exactly the same. You see this example over here. There's only two microns difference between this LASIK flap that's basically been created by the vision max between the central area and basically the paracentral or the peripheral basically area as well. And the third reason is with some of the femtosecond lasers, certainly the intraocular pressure is low. And in this study we published back in 2010, we, we cannulated the anterior chamber of these rabbit eyes. And we basically monitored the intraocular pressure in real time during the creation of the LASIK flap. What you can see over here with the microkeratome, you get a big spike in IOP. This goes up to almost 150 millimeters of mercury. And then basically this comes down while with the femtosecond laser, this was using the vision max, a maximum it goes up to about 60, 70 millimeters of mercury, and then basically comes down during the creation of the ablation. So we introduced uh, femtosecond lasers to our refractive service back in 2007, 2008. And you can see over here 
the microkeratome usage basically from that time period to dramatically basically drop down. And I mean, we hard, I think, I'm not sure we still have microkeratome. I think we probably have one in the animal house, but we, we hardly ever use it on basically patients. So basically 100% of our cases are femtosecond laser, uh, flap creation, and this has really been since 2010. But you can see how femtosecond lasers really affected our technology that we were basically using. And we run three, plat we run four platforms, so three of them over here, the Visumax, the Intralase, the Zima, and also now the FS200 as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you some differences between the flap creations, the Intralase flap on the left-hand side, Visual One, Visumax right on the right-hand side. Generally, your Intralase flaps are much larger. Of course, most of the population that I basically operate on are Chinese, so generally they have slightly smaller eyes. Typically, you get an 8.9 millimeter flap with the Intralase, or 8.4 millimeter flap with the Visumax. The, once you basically do the centration or docking with the interlace, you'll all be aware that you can move the flap on the screen. You can't do this with the vision map. So you require the patient to fixate on the light to get the centration. So you require the patient to see the green flashing light itself. And the other big difference you'll see is that because of the differences in the energy uh, between the vision max and the interlace, the vision max runs at basically much lower energies, running at about 100. 35, 140 uh, nanojoule range itself, while the interlace is running at about about, about 800 uh, nanojoule range as well. So you're looking at a much higher level of basically energy, and that's why you need to have a pocket over here to release some of the gas when you basically create your flap. So a few years back, we did some studies in comparison because we wanted a few centers that actually had two uh, from second lasers that we could compare to, and we wanted to look at the outcomes of the intralase and the visual max. And basically what the study showed, there was no significant difference with respect to visual acuity, as you'd expect. They had the same excimer laser basically used um, for both um, uh, patients and stuff so between one and three months of safety and efficacy indices were very similar between basically both of them lasers. But one of the interesting things that we basically found was is that when we collected the tear samples from the patient, so it was a randomized controlled trial eye, one eye had a flap created with an interlace, the other eye had a flap created with a uh, Visumax, they had the same excimer ablation and pretty much the same refractive error basically in MOFIs that we basically matched for. And what you can see is, is that interestingly, when you take the tear samples and you run it through basically mass spec, you can see that there's a different compensatory, uh, you can see there's a different compensatory lacrimal response with respect to uh, ocular surface homeostasis. On the left-hand side, you'll see figures over here. Visumax is in the clear box. Intralase is in the darkened box over here. And you'll see higher levels of lacrotin, clusterin, and also MSL1. And what these things are, these are compensatory mechanisms from the lacrimal gland to maintain a good ocular surface following basically the flap creation. You can see these are highly regulated in Visumax, and they were down-regulated in the intralase. Likewise, on the other side, on the right-hand side over here, you look at down-regulated proteins that we saw were the interlases, and this was related to the neural arc. So because there's a difference in the size of the lacy flap creation, we were getting a reduction in neural arc reflex um, in the interlase size, which we didn't basically see in the Visumax size. And these were just using standard flap sizes that most people have basically recommended. So it does make a difference with what flap you're basically using for your creation for your LASIK procedure, depending on how the eye is going to basically recover afterwards. So if you have somebody who possibly, you know, borderline dry eyes or a bit of risk of basically getting dry eye disease after LASIK, you may want to use a laser that's going to be a little bit more ocular surface protective than one where you're going to get a larger flap and it's going to be more disruptive to the ocular surface. So the third generation of lasers really came out probably, I would say, in about maybe 2012, 2014, around that kind of era as well. And you can see that things got even faster. So you got 80 kilohertz now with the, with the, with the Tecmolas, 150 with the Intralase, 200 with the FS200, 500 for the Vision Max, we went from 200 basically up to 500, and, uh, and we're up to still with the megahertz system with the Vision Max. But the other thing that we basically learned from was the fact that we got a lot more extra function. So the laser was not there purely to make LASIK flaps. We could do keratoplasty, we could do intracore with the Femtech, we could do AKs, you can make pockets, you could put ICR rings, we could do SMILE, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. And of course, with the Z8, you can actually do femtocatract as well as basically doing refractive surgery. So we saw a lot of new options basically coming to us where you're investing in a piece of equipment that can just do more than basically make one flap. And I think this is important to us or basically as anterior segment surgeons, that you get more, more out of the basically the laser or the equipment that you've got basically got. So let's just talk a little bit about Smile. So Relax Smile was first uh, coined basically by Carl Zeiss Meditech. It's a completely different procedure, of course, to laser because one laser, the femtosecond laser, creates a lenticle that you can see be created on the right-hand side. So with LASIK, of course, you will know you have a flap and an excimer laser ablation. But with Smile, as you can see on the right-hand side, once a lenticle is created, you get a small pocket 
I typically keep it at superior temporal size, so I'm right-handed, and this is simply dissected out above and below the lenticle itself to basically free off any tissue adhesion and then remove from the eye. So the amount of tissue that is removed is very similar between basically LASIK and, base and SMILE. The difference is, of course, with LASIK, the tissue is vaporized by the excimer laser, while with SMILE, the femtosecond laser basically cuts out the lenticule, basically, and then it's, and it's removed from the eye. So it's a closed lasering system with uh, Relax or with SMILE. Um, so there's a less effect of stromal hydration or fractures, and this is especially important when you're doing moderate to high degrees of myopia. The energy system or the energy source is a bit more stable. It's femtosecond as opposed to a solid state laser. And of course, it's less sensitive uh, to eye movements. And again, when you're doing moderate to high degrees of myopia where the patient may move, I know a lot of the obviously modern excitement lasers have trackers now, but it, you have less of an issue for basically patient movement because the eye is fixed during the lenticle creation because it's your lenticle creation that's going to basically give you the refractive error. So one of the questions is, is that how is it possible, having shown you that diagram on the top, that you can cut a lenticule, which is a three-dimensional shape, when you're using a femtosecond laser that's cutting in basically 2D. So I've shown you this line and spacing, and I show you this basically picture of the histology, and this is an SEM showing you the actual bu cavitation bubbles uh, taken at the level of the interface. So in order to create a lenticule like this, so this is a lenticle of one of my patients that's been basically removed from the eye, you have to be able to not only cut in basically X and Y axis, you need to be able to cut very accurately in z-axis, okay? If you cannot cut an accurate z-axis focus, you're not gonna be able to cut a lenticle because of the shape of the lenticle in the corneal stroma. So a few years back, we looked at this in detail using this um, helium ion microscopy. This was published back in 2014 now. And what we did was we looked at the, uh, uh, the corneas that I'd lasered uh, with the visual max on one side and the intralaser on the other side. And the idea was to compare a high or a mod or low energy nanojoule laser, which is the Vishimax, which is working at 140 nanojoules, compared to an 850 nanojoule laser, which is basically the intralase. And what you can see from the picture and the quantification on the right-hand side, the red ones are in basically in the intralase, and the white ones are in the, in the Vishimax itself. So what you can see is when you measure the pore sizes, and you can see this, even though this is electron microscopy, is because these tissues are completely unprepared, so you don't need to put any um, palladium or any um, heavy metal in there to get a reflection from, from the stretch tissue of the stromal surface. And that's why you can basically see these little nice pores over here where you can actually see the pulses in the corneal stroma. So what we showed was is that the pore diameters on the left-hand side of the vision marks were much smaller than those of the intralase. So it's 0.9 compared to 2.2. Likewise, if you measure these, you can see you can get very tight spacing with the Richard Max, it's actually four micron spacing compared to basically 9.2 micron spacing. So if you have a 9.2 micron spacing, you're not gonna be able to cut 3D structure itself because it means your pulses are basically firing all over the place within, with respect to the Z axis. You get away with it because you have higher energy and as you get that photo disruption bubble, you can burst open the cavitation bubble to be able to get a level of the interface, which is fine when you're creating a LASIK flap or when you start creating shapes into the cornea like lenticle, it becomes a huge issue. And the third thing we showed was if you look at this figure down over here, which is figure J, what you're seeing is a TEM picture in cross section and you're looking at the Z axis focus. And what you can see is the difference between the Z axis focus between, between the vision max and the intralase is almost basically double. So it's two microns or 2.2 microns for the um, uh, vision max, but it's four microns basically for the intralase. What it shows you is, is that the numerical aperture of the laser is much larger for the vision max to allow you to get a tighter Z axis focus. So you get a much higher chance of being able to cut or carve out basically a lenticle from the stroma, or you've got a four four micron axes as well, and then a standard deviation on top of that, you're gonna basically not be able to cut out individual intricate shapes, especially when you're trying to correct somebody's refractive error. So this is illustrating the same uh, point as well. So on the left-hand side, you see lasers that have a small numerical aperture, and you, don't, you can work this out basically, as soon as anybody tells you the pulsing of a laser pulse, I can work out exactly where the size of the numerical aperture will be. If you have a high pulse laser, it's typically got a smaller numerical aperture. The typically the lasers we're talking about, intralase, femtech, and FS200, and you can see the z-axis basically focusing over here itself. So the numerical aperture is related to the basically the distance of the laser head from basically from the optical interface. If you have lasers that have a larger numerical aperture, so the largest, a larger numerical aperture is typically the visual max, the largest is basically what we see in the Zima. Typically, basically what will happen is you'll get a much more focal basically spot size. Okay, which means your laser pulse is going to be focused with a much tighter basically standard deviation. 
What that would mean is if it compared to say, if we're talking about LASIK flaps, it means your standard deviation on your specific LASIK flap will be tighter. Now, you may say to me, well, hang on, John, but maybe four or five microns makes no difference. And you're absolutely correct. It makes no difference probably for when you're doing LASIK because it's already talking about four or five micron deviation. But when you start to cut about lenticules within the cornea, then shape becomes a much more important issue and you must basically be more accurate from there as well. The other thing about when you have a large numerical aperture, because you get a smaller focal volume, it allows you to use lower pulse energies. And this is especially more important with the new lasers that are coming out now from Schwinn, uh, from j and &J, um, and also basically from uh, the new uh, Visumax. Um, these lasers are, have, are running at very low energies now because you're going to get basically lower pulse energy because they're going to get less cavitation bubbles formed around the pulsation. Okay, so you can see this basically when you fire the laser pulse into water. So if you look at the left-hand side, you have a much larger numerical aperture pulse, and you can see that big drag around the laser pulse. On the, on, on the right-hand side, where the pulse has just basically disappeared, what you can see is that as you fire the laser pulse into water, you can see the smaller, basically, focal spot side. And the laser pulse is coming from the left, so you always get the drag basically behind the pulsation. So what I just basically showed you on the schematic, you can basically see in water as well, when you see the pulse basically tracking. So, and this is exactly the same laser pulse, so it's a femtosecond laser, 150 uh, pulse. But the difference you can see is in the numerical aperture. On the left-hand side is 0.2, on the right-hand side is 0.6. When you increase the numerical aperture, you're gonna get a much tighter, basically, focal spot size. So we started doing uh, SMILE, basically, back in 2011 now, so nine years ago. So when we had, uh, with the laser, we had an opportunity to do some interesting research work. So one of the things we wanted to look at was truly, do you have a significant wound healing advantage compared to when you're looking at a femtosecond versus an excimer laser. And I showed you previously the fact that the UV lasers typically um, have more basically energy. And what you can see from this study is, is that when you look compared to LASIK on the left-hand side, when we go from minus three to basically minus nine, compared to relex or flex, which is the lenticle extraction procedure, you can see with LASIK, as you increase the energy from three to nine, you're increasing the wound healing response. So you can see from this triangle basically over here, and this is using immuno combo for microscopy. Likewise, when you look at the amount of inflammation, so you're looking at these green cells over here, again, when you go from minus three to minus nine, you increase the amount of inflammation in LASIK, but with RELAX, it's almost basically exactly the same. And the reason why that is, is that basically is this table over here. And what this table basically shows you is, is that with RELAX or SMILE or lenticle extraction or any of the lenticle extraction procedures, whether you do a minus three or basically minus nine procedure, the amount of energy that goes into the cornea is exactly the same. When, while LASIK, when you increase the excimer energy, the, all the energy is coming from the excimer laser because it's the UV laser, okay? So it's a high, powerful laser. That's where the energy is coming from. And as you increase from minus three, basically minus nine, you're tripling the amount of energy basically that's basically put into the cornea. So the other advantage is basically with uh, lenticle extraction on the left-hand side, basically you see a patient of mine who is a part of our RCT that has smile. On the right-hand side, you see somebody basically, you, the other eye, the same individual that has basically patient, I had uh, LASIK done. So this incision typically is about nine times basically smaller. And when you look at the ocular surface, okay, when you look at the surface over here in the LASIK eye, typically you'll see this inferior punctate apathy in the early postoperative period as you're basically getting improvement in neural regeneration following the procedure where the nerves have been transected by the LASIK graph. But typically we don't see that with basically smile. You do get dry eyes after smile, there's no doubt. But of course, when you take the lenticule out of the eye, lots of basically stromal nerves in the lenticle, so you're gonna get a denervation. The difference that we then, oh, I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides is we're able to go and show that you get a faster nerve recovery with a smile compared to basically LASIK. And this is how we basically showed that. So what we did was is that we took the lenticles out from the eyes. You can see this is your stromal nerves over here. And this is in a rabbit eye. And what you can see over here is that this is LASIK at two weeks basically post-op. So this is basically superior. So this is where the superior hinge and you can see the nerves basically tracking over here. This is the edge of the LASIK flap and you can see the nerve is truncated over here itself. While with SMILE, you're missing the area of the nerves, typically where the incision is, but of course you have nerves on the inferior part coming back, which of course this has been undisturbed because your lenticule is typically removed below your subbasal nerve plexus, so you don't damage that basically plexus as well. And when you look at eight weeks, you can see there's a significant improvement in the nerve regeneration basically in the SMILE eyes, but you don't see the same thing in the LASIK eyes, 
but you still got retarded recovery of the inferior basically nerves around the edge of basically your LASIK valve as well. And what we're able to show over here is that following the procedures, you get a reduction in subbasal nerve plexus in basically both groups. The differences that we basically were showing was is that you get a faster nerve recovery in the small group compared to basically LASIK group. Subsequent to this paper, there have been many studies that basically have come out from clinical patients showing very similar results what we basically showed in these rabbit eyes where you basically get improvement in ocular surface homeostasis with small basically compared to LASIK. So the current generation of our femtocataract machines really lies with basically these five lasers and then the, the Zima you've basically seen before and these are the other lasers that can basically do femtocataract surgery. So what you'll see with the lasers over here, you see there's a difference in the repetition rate and we spoke about the differences in the speed and a little bit, this, a little bit of this is dependent on how the, basically the pulse is created as well. But the things I want to point out was is basically two things over here. So one is the energy. So if you look at the pulse energy, Generally, most of these laser systems work in the microjoule range, okay? It's similar to an older intralase where you're using cavitation to drive the force in which your laser pulse is basically created. While the Zemo on the right-hand side over here works in the nanojoule range. And that can offer advantages, but it also can offer disadvantages as well. The second thing is looking at the interface. You see the interfaces, most of them will basically use liquid interface, because of course we know that causes less distortions on the cornea. Uh, Zima system has a liquid and a flat interface, okay? So you can use it for different applications. So flat, uh, flat interface you use, say, for LASIK flaps or some corneal surgery. For liquid interface, we use basically, basically for cataract surgery. Okay, so you remember that paper that I showed you earlier from basically Steve Wilson's group. So what we did was back in 2013, when we had the Z6, we wanted to see if this whole theory or the ideology about having low energy was really true because it was all basically mathematical and it was related to basically physics. And the whole point was, was that we knew that the Zima laser had the largest numerical aperture and it was very well touted that by having a large numerical aperture, we can use very, very low pulses. And that when you use a low pulse, the reason why you can get the pulses down faster is that you need a very fast repetition rate. So that's why it's working in the mega kilohertz range and that allows you to basically put the pulses down faster. So what we showed in this study was, is that when we compared the Vision Max, which is working in about the 140 nanojoule range, compared to the Zima, which is working in the 1 to 5 nanojoule range over here, what you can see is that with the Zima system, we're able to cut the cornea, and this is shown in this bar, in this figure over here, into the stroma. When you count the number of dead cells over here, you can see there's hardly any dead cells with the Zima system versus to what we were able to see with the vision max. So initially when I saw this, I thought, how is, how is this possible, right? You can cut the cornea with a laser without actually killing a cell. Then when we looked at these results, you can see, if you look very closely, the epithelial cells are more damaged with the Zima compared to the vision max. So, so why is that? Well, that's because the, the Zima system uses a flat applinator. So when you damage the superficial cells when you're doing the applination, while the vision max uses a curved applinator. So I knew that all the staining basically was working correctly because we're actually picking up a couple of dead cells on the epithelium, which is what you basically expect to see with any flat applinating system itself. So this gave us the idea that you could cut the stroma without actually inducing a scar because you're not basically killing any keratocytes. So of course we know for cataract now, uh, there are three parts basically to the procedure. So we have fragmentation, you have basically rexus, and basically you have corneal incisions as well. And we know that generally if you have a higher energy, and you would remember the reports when femtocatrol basically first came out, people were getting capsular back, uh, blockage issues, they were getting weak basically rexus as well, they were getting more inflammation inside the eyes. It's a very familiar story for most people doing anti-segment surgery because it's exactly what we saw when femtosecond lasers came to the cornea as well. And problems with high energy can really cause increased inflammation. You can get pupillary meiosis from high levels of prostaglandin rage. And of course, if you have a capsular tag, uh, you can get basically get a weakness in the tag. This paper was published in IOBS by Mayer's group in 2015. What it shows you is the effect of energy again, but this time it's showing you on a capsulotomy. Okay? And on the left-hand side, it shows you a manual rexus over here. And these blue cells over here, or sorry, these blue cells are the live cells or the epithelial cells. And these ones in are red over here, the dead cells. On the top right-hand side over here, you can see one with a high femto energy microrexis. You can see all this area of dead cells around this area. And this one shows you reduced energy where you have much more epithelial cells and you have reduced levels of inflammation around the area of basically the rexus. And of course, this is the capsular otomy that's basically created by the basically the laser. But it shows you principally the same thing that we thought was happening in the, in the cornea, of course, is gonna happen in the basic lens capsule as well. Now, when you create a basically capsulotomy with a ZA, you, there's two ways the laser is basically firing. On the left-hand side, you'll see the fragmentation. So you see the laser head is keeping absolutely still. 
On the right hand side, you see a gentle rocking motion. What's happening is that the laser head is basically spinning round. This is very different to other femtosecond laser, or other femtocataract basically machines. Because as the capsulotomy is basically being created, the laser head is actually rotating round in a basically spinning fashion. That's because the laser head, or the most expensive bit of the equipment, is basically lying in that surgeon's hand over here because you're holding it basically onto the patient's eye. So what's the effect of that? Well, if you see this as an example, this is one of my patients from about five years ago now when we use a femtocatrack, and I use the high energy laser system. Now I want you to watch over here very closely. I'm just doing some IA and I thought, well, let's just see how strong this capsule is itself. When I put the suction on, you'll see it's actually taken a bite out of the anterior capsule. You see, the anterior capsule is basically missing over here itself. So what happens is if you use a high energy laser system to create your capsulotomy itself, okay, what happens is the energy goes up so fast and then basically comes down so quickly itself that sure you'll get a capsulotomy basically created around that area. But what happens is the collagen fibers are going to basically be melted around that area. So the example I give is like if you get a Mars bar and you take it out to a hot temperature itself, what happens is the caramel will basically melt and then you bring it back in immediately, you stick it in the freezer, it'll basically solidify as well. Now, the Mars bar will still be there in its normal shape, but what will happen is it's going to be basically be much weaker and it's going to be basically more brittle. This is what happens if you're using too much energy when you're basically creating your capsulotomy. So we studied this in a bit of detail, and this shows you the same thing that I'm basically showing you. With most capsulotomy laser systems, you're basically using a vertical firing system, and with a ZA over here, for example, you're using basically a rotational and a vertical system. So when, it, when you fire the fragmentation, it fires vertically. When you're doing the capsulotomy, it basically fires in a rotation. And the effect you can basically see on the outcome of the capsule. So what you'll see is over here, this is an SEM picture of a manual, basically, capsulotomy that we created for one of our patients. This is basically taken from the literature, I think it's from J JCRS, where you see two high energy systems. One is a Victus on the top and one is a, cat a catalyst at the bottom. And what you'll see is that as the pulses have been created, you're getting these lines around the edge of basically the capsule. And that's because one laser pulse is applied on another one, applied on another one on top above it. And as the cavitation bubbles are basically forming, that's actually what's causing the basic disruption or basically the fibers themselves. And this is why you get these kind of ridges. So that's why sometimes the literature is very confusing between manual capsulotomy because manual capsulotomy, you're actually tearing in a round circle itself. And actually you can get a quite a strong tear. You cut it into a basically a nice circular level. And that's why there's always disruption or differences in the literature when you're comparing femto capsulotomies versus basically manual. And when we study the Z8, this is the area of the edge of the capsule. So you get a capsule that looks much closer to basically a manual one compared to these vertical ridges over here. But you get this because this is basically cut in a round circle. So that the pulses are basically laid down like an Archimedes spiral, but they cut around in a round circle. And the Archimedes spiral will vary between about 400 to 600 microns, depending on whatever the laser settings are as well. So you get a much basically more natural, basically capsulotomy created around the level of your, of your capsulotomy basically cut. Now, one of the things about these femtosecond lasers that I basically showed you was, is that the idea was they were supposed to do a lot more things than just basically create flaps or basically even use for just cataract surgery. So obviously as corneal surgeons, we're interested in basically seeing whether these can be used for basically help our corneal surgery. And probably one of the most difficult corneal surgical procedures is basically to do DOL. So this interesting paper came out of Italy and what they did was, is that they realized that you could easily create a vertical cut basically when you're doing DOL surgery, but actually the most difficult thing is actually doing the intrastromal tunnel. So what they did was they created a fabricated basically mask. They put this in the interlaced cone over here in order to basically fire the femtosecond laser to try to create an interface and then be able to try to, try to create a tunnel. This is what the basically the mask showed like. So you had a lamella cut of basically at 100 microns. The preoperative scan was taken from your preoperative uh, topography to give you an idea basically of your depth. So you take it from the corneal thinnest points from your topography, which is basically about 50 microns. And the idea was to basically make a basically tunnel on this side over here. So they customized basically a flap around the surface and you basically, you took your preoperative scan from your uh, topography and then you basically use a flat affination system on the surface. Now the other interesting thing that this paper basically showed was, is that the closer you got to the endothelium, the more damage there was with the femtosecond laser. So what you can see over here is that when you were 50 microns away, there was quite a reasonable amount of damage. When you were 150 microns away with the femtosecond laser, then there wasn't so much damage. So this is related to the energy 
of the laser that's basically being used. This was typically, this, was, this study was done using the intralase as well. Now this is important because of course, as you all know, when you're trying to create a big bubble when you're doing dull, you want to get as close as you can to the endothelium. So typically between 80 uh, to 50 microns away before you basically initiate the bubble. So we were working with the Zima system, which is a Z8 system, which is a low energy system. So we knew we should be able to overcome some of these issues with basically low energy as well. The OCT that we're using, instead of using a pre-operative OCT or pre-operative topography, we use the OCT that's available in the system that you can basically use for cataract surgery. So we're using the cataract surgery OTT to image the cornea itself. And what you can do is you can make a lamella cut over here, you can make these little tunnels around the side over here, and then you can just the, you can judge the distance between the edge of the tunnel compared to the edge of the decimase membrane. So typically we can use 100 basically microns or 80 microns, and then you can put your basically your cannula in in order to basically get your big bubble. But this is all basically adjustable that you, you can basically do adjust these parameters as well. Okay, so this basically shows you the screen. This is basically in a pig eye. So it shows you the cut. You can show the adjustment of the height. So this is going to be the edge of your tunnel. So what it typically does, it will do the tunnel, and then it basically does your lamella cut, and then it does the ring cut around the edge. So all these are basically customizable. This is basically what it looks like. So you peel off the surface of the lamella cut, and you can see the tunnel cut basically over here on the right-hand side. Okay. So initially when we started you working with this about two years ago now, uh, we wanted to see how accurate it was because I was unhappy making tunnels so close to the endothelium if the accuracy of the laser wasn't going to be so good. So what we did was we looked at 100 microns, we looked at 130 microns, we used OCT and also histology, and you can see it was pretty recently accurate. We got about 14.5 deviation on an OCT and about 8.6 deviation um, on histology. So what we were aiming for was reasonably good. We know we have to aim between about 100 or 80 microns away before you're going to initiate basically a big bubble. So this is using a human cadaver eye where I've used the laser to do the cutting and I've used the cannula to basically just go into that hole. I'm injecting an air bubble and you'll see a big bubble basically just being formed there now. So we have a big bubble basically formed around this area. So this is typically a type one bubble basically formed around this thing. So the laser has cut the tunnel, it's cut the depth of the tunnel. And all I've done is basically enter the cannula basically inside the eye. When you look at the bubble, this is basically what it looks like. So this is one of the, one of the cadaver eyes that we basically use. You can see the nice bubble separation and typically you've got a separation away from basically Dewar's layer or the pre stromal layer. And you've got typically you've got a type one bubble, you've got a nice basically split away from the decimate membrane. And in the first paper that basically wrote, this is one of our clinical basically cases. So this patient has a scar, he's a keratoconic. So after we basically put suction onto the laser, you'll see that basically once we go to the docking side of the uh, side of the part of the procedure, here we go. So you go to docking, you can see the scar there. So now we're using the intraoperative OCT. Now you see these folds here in the decimase membrane because remember this is using a flat applinator in order to basically create the tunnel. We then basically adjust the tunnel depth. So typically we aim between about 80 to 100 microns away from decimase membrane. And then what you can do is you can adjust this round. You allow this to do this in two planes, both horizontal and also basically vertical in order to basically get the depth right. And of course you err on the side of caution basically when you do this. Once you're ready, you fire the laser so it's done the tunnel. And now it's going to basically do the lamella cut across the surface. Now, because it's a bit sticky there, where there's an opacity, of course, you don't expect the laser to fire through that area, but the rest of the lamella cut should be quite reasonable from there. But remember, this stroma is going to basically be removed anyway, basically once you get the big bubble and stuff. Okay, so that's your cut basically done. So now you just simply basically peel this back. So you basically remove the area basically where there's a bit of adhesion from the surface there. And this is basically simply removed. Then you just use a cannula, uh, typically we use a cannula from Asico. So it's got, a, it's got an opening at the bottom, then you inject the air, okay, and then you have a big bubble. So of course it doesn't work like this all the time, I'm showing you a good one, but generally speaking, this is basically the way that you can basically do, the, do your big bubble surgery much faster than we were basically conventionally doing it in the past. Um, if you don't get a bubble, what you can do is the laser has an offset of about 100 or have about offset about 50 microns. So you can go 50 microns deeper and you can complete the surgery with a manual dissection as well. So you can give you a little a route there itself. If you don't get a bubble to complete, to complete your surgery. So either way, it's going to be faster than doing what we're basically doing conventionally as well. So the last thing I'm going to show you is some uh, work that we were doing for the last maybe four years where we're using the same laser technology, but doing for something completely different. And this is basically ocular surface surgery, okay? So same, same using the same CMFM second laser technology, but one of our ideas was to see whether we thought, could it cut, could it cut the ocular surface? And it comes down to the numerical aperture or basically the laser. 
So previously I showed you the tight z-axis focusing of a numerical aperture. But one of the other advantages of a large numerical aperture is that if you have an opacity in the field or basically focus on the laser, if you have a small numerical aperture with the same size opacity over here, you can see in this picture over here, it has a much larger effect on disruption of the laser photobeams. What that means is if you have a high energy laser and there's an opacity in the cornea, it's much more difficult to basically cut through the opacity. However, if you have a laser that has a large numerical aperture, you can overcome the effect of the opacity in much more detail. And this math shows you the difference in a 50 micron opacity. It's 30% in, in, in a situation of a smaller numerical aperture compared to 3.5% in something with a large numerical aperture. So it gave us the idea a few years back now, back in 2015, that you should be able to get better cutting performance in opaque, basically, corneas or tissues. So we thought, okay, could you cut the conjunctival with this laser? So of course, we thought we'd try, we'd try and of course, the archetypal conjunctival disease is basically pterygium surgery. And we all know that basically the gold standard for tuition surgery is using basically a conjunctival autograph. You can use AMT, and I know it's quite popular in the United States basically to use AMT, but generally most of the randomized controlled trials have always shown that using a conjunctival autograph is superior than basically using uh, amniotic membrane postoperatively. One of the issues we're doing using um, conjunctival autographing is basically trying to obtain a nice thin flap, so I leave basically without any tenons there as well. And that's one of the skills in basically being able to do to regime surgery. And we know there's a difference in recurrence rates between experienced surgeons and less experienced surgeons. And people basically say that more experienced surgeons can get basically thinner flaps. So that's why they basically, their recurrence rates is basically slower, uh, is less, because they basically have less basically tenons. This study from Australia basically showed how long it took a trainee to cut a 65 micron basically flap. And what it basically took, it took him almost 57 graphs to be able to consistently cut a graph that was at, at 60 microns. But you can see over here, there's still a large variation in the thickness of the graph that's basically cut in this basically cadaver model. So what we did was back in 2016, um, we started basically with a laser using on some pig eyes and we cut some condensable autographs with the laser to basically see whether it's even possible to cut through this basically opaque tissue. We looked at 10 different graphs of different diameters, different energy settings, and at two different depths, one at 100 microns, one at basically 60 microns. And we had two different surgeons, myself, and basically one of the fellows, and we analyzed basically the graphs that were created to look with histology and basically OCT as well. So you can see, we just mark it with a pen over here to help with histology. This is typically what the graphs basically look like. They're quite thin. You do get a lot of adhesions in pig eyes, basically, from the tenons itself. But it cut reasonably well, like basically, around that area. And what we found was is that it took about 20 seconds, basically, to do the cutting. There was no difference in the area or the size of the graft, and there was no difference with this in the separation between myself and, basically, one of my fellows. When you look at the graphs, this is on histology, at the top over here, and OCT in the bottom, you can see the graphs were actually quite planar. So the central and the peripheral area were quite similar. But when you look at the thickness, actually we found the 60 micron graphs were much more accurate compared to the 100 micron graphs. And what that means was, is that we were picking up a bit of extra tenons tissue with the 100 micron graphs, which we weren't picking up with the 60 micron. So we decided that we we're gonna go for 60 micron graphs because it seemed to be basically more accurate. One of the worries was, or one of the things that we thought about was, what about the blood vessel? Because if it's a high energy laser, you might actually disrupt the blood vessels. And using some special staining, this GSI B4, which is an isoelectin staining, what you can see is over here in one of the graft tissues over here, you can see the large bore vessels in B and the small bore vessels in C are still maintained in the graft. So when you do a conjunctival graft, of course, you want to make sure the blood vessel is still viable because you want the new blood vessels to basically integrate with that. I'll show you how we showed that in some of the patients. So this shows you the accuracy of the laser. So this is myself in the middle. So it's a pretty reasonable tight accuracy. There was no significant difference between myself and my fellow who's never even used the laser system. So it showed it's actually quite reproducible regardless of basically experience. So why did we choose 60 microns? So the reason why we chose 60 microns is like I was saying, 60 microns is purely the epithelial thickness. If you look in this study over here from subjects from the age of, this is in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. Of course, as you get older, your conjunctival epithelium does get a little bit thicker, but you'll see the majority of the graphs themselves, or the majority of the conjunctival epithelium is less than 60 microns. 60 microns is about the cutoff of the laser that you can actually cut. You can cut 50, but it's quite difficult to basically do that. So we, that's why we stuck with 60 microns, but you're taking a pure conjunctival epithelial basically graft. Okay, so this is one of the cases, it's not the first case that we did, but it's quite a nice case I'd like to show. So you take off the trisium in the normal manner, so you take it from the head, and then you basically take off the head of the trisium basically from the uh, top of the, basically the cornea. So this is just in the standard technique that you basically normally try to do. And then while you basically do this, uh, you basically do a tenons resection. 
and try to make sure you've got a nice, basically, bare scleral bed. Okay, then the eyes rotated down. And we mark about four millimeters of back away from the limbus. So I normally use calipers just to mark. We place the laser head directly onto the conjunctiva and we use a 10 by 7 pre-programmed laser shape on the surface. Now, there's no suction here, so you're just basically keeping it on the surface. It's very important to keep that um, the, the traction suture basically tight. It takes about 16 seconds basically to cut the graft. Then you can, do, you can do an OCT afterwards. The OCT technician will tell us how thick it is. And then simply you peel off the conjunctival epithelium. Okay, spread it out so you can see how thin it is basically on the surface. So you spread out all the conjunctiva. It's important to basically spread out because it does shrink. So it's obviously quite elastic. And of course you use your glue basically from the surface. And you flip it over. Okay, now this is the important part. It's very important that you crimp the edges from the graph because these graphs are so thin that you want to crimp the edge. But what will happen is, as you'll see in the pictures post up, it'll integrate so well into the conjunctiva that it's very difficult to tell there's actually even been a graph there itself because the conjunctiva will basically expand and pull, hold this graph basically out of time. Okay, so these are some of the examples. This is where actually the first person that actually had surgery. So this is basically pre-op, this is basically post-op. And this year we started obviously with small cases. Now we basically pretty much do any case that we want. These are two particularly uh, big cases. And you can see over here, these are three months basically post-op. It's very difficult to actually see where there's any basically conjunctival surgery at all. And that's because the integration between the interface between the conjunctival is the same thickness as your normal conj. As long as you get the edges very well nicely aligned, it's very difficult to see that I've actually had any conjunctival surgery. So cosmesis with this level of with the surgery is basically very high. Uh, one of the other things that's very interesting is that if you look at the resection site where the, uh, where the graft has been harvested, because you're leaving all that tenons, you don't get any scarring. Okay, and the epithelium will basically grow back by eight days. On the left-hand side, you'll see this paper from Korea published in 2017, where they, they documented almost in 126 eyes, 20% of the excesions had complications with basically donor site issues following conjunctival surgery. So either a scarring, as you can see on the top side, or you can basically get granuloma formation. And this is obviously what you're trying to achieve, which is basically a normal conjunctival basically looking. In fact, this is one of our post-op patients who's actually had trisium surgery already, and he had the scar, but he had a trisium graft removed basically from this area. You can see how well basically it's healed from the surface. So you get less inflammation, you get rapid healing time, you get minimal scarring, and this is of course important in the future. If ever you want to basically use the site for basically glaucoma surgery, then there's basically minimal scarring basically on the surface. So in our trial that was just recently published, um, we did 30 cases. We compared this to a basically a manual group. We kept it for one year follow. We've done about 150 cases now. I mean, since 2016, we did the first case. So now we do basically most all our cases with basically the laser. Um, basically showed that there's about a five second time to basically lift up the graph. Our average graph thing is between about, we're aiming for 60, we've got about 74. We had one year follow-up, we haven't had any recurrences in our first 150 cases, mainly done by, to be, to be fair, by two surgeons. We also haven't had any cases of recurrence, but of course we need larger numbers basically from this basically going forwards as well. One of the things I mentioned about vascularity is basically important, and we published this study uh, last year in AGO, looking at blood vessels and using OCT angiography, we're able to show that these graphs, even though there were 60 microns, were able to revascularize well, and you can see the difference between one week and basically one month on the OCT angiography using segmentation, showing you how you've got new blood vessels entering the kind of graphs as well, okay? So in summary, the laser plays an integral part in our practice in all subspecialities of ophthalmology. Understanding how they work is vital to get the best out of them. There are many femtoseconds lasers for refractive and cataract surgery, but apart from the word femtoseconds, they all work completely different. I can tell you, we have three new prototype lasers in our center that we're basically testing and we're using for clinical trials. So there are more lasers that are coming mainly from the same companies, but they're newer generations based on the lasers. Understanding the nuances will allow you to get the best out of the laser system that you have or the one you basically want to purchase. So I took this picture from a trip to basically Thailand where they basically think that, I mean, you ask somebody, is this drink the same? They say it's same, same, but it's basically different. And it's exactly true for femtosecond lasers. So I'd like to thank you for the invitation uh, to talk and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I can't hear. Him. Can you hear me, Joe? Yeah, I can hear. You. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I was, I was kind of just saying that that's a great uh, overview of uh, the various lasers. 
and you've got a nice um, uh, playground there with all your lasers you can kind of compare and contrast. Um, I, if there's any questions from the audience, they can go ahead and either submit it to the chat or uh, let us know. But I have a few questions for you. Yeah. Um, with COVID going on and the uh, different procedures and patients coming in wearing masks, um, there's been some talk on ablations or uh, laser treatments with masks. And can you comment on that? So there are various interfaces that are out there. Yeah. Sure or not? Yeah. Really? I, I, I saw something, somebody said that you can get misting and something around the interface. Certainly, I mean, I, we've been doing um, uh, refractive basically at least for about uh, over a month now and stuff, and we haven't had any issues. I mean, we use, primarily I use a, uh, I've used, in the last month, I've used Visionmax, the Intralase and the Zima, and we haven't basically had any Intralase. Ob interoperatively, when, obviously when you're doing cataract surgery or pterygium, when I use the laser, it makes no difference because of course the patient's already draped anyway from that. In the refractive suite, I haven't seen any basically difference itself with them. They all wear basically a mask when they come in the door and things like that. But I haven't seen any issues with any issues with misting uh, at all when we're doing the cuts and stuff. Okay, and then in addition to the NA and the um, uh, the type of, of uh, suction, yeah. what besides the Zimmer, can other uh, femto platforms do the pterygium procedure or assist in the pterygium procedure? Yeah, so you, so there are, um, uh, so how can I, so I can tell you that there are other lasers that will be commercially available probably within the next year. And generally now, now we, now there are four laser systems, three of, three of CMR that can do lenticle extraction. So the art, so you can always tell because you see, um, if you, if you can do it, if you can cut a lenticle, then you know they must have a moderate to large numerical aperture because there's no way you can cut that with the old cavitation basically bubble system itself. So that tells you straight away. If you have a, and if you have an energy system in that level and you have a flat applinator, then you'll be able to do tuition. So I can tell you that um, uh, I've used at least two other uh, machines that can cut lenticules. And there's a third one we're probably gonna be trying in the middle of beginning of next year, which should also be able to do tuition as well as do lenticules as well. Okay. Um, the other question I had with has respect to corneal transplants and how we're looking into doing decimates stripping only or decimates without endothelial keratoplasty. For yeah. DSO, they're uh, you know advocating using the actual shearing mechanism of doing a forceps a removal of the central, say four millimeters of endothelium. Do yeah. you do you see? Um, uh, the newer lasers, or do you see some of the current lasers being able to assist in DSO surgery? So um, the um, the Zima has a platform. I mean, I, I didn't talk about it, uh, today where you can do a PK uh, with a liquid applinator. Okay. So one of the issues is that you will not be able to do this with a flat applinate system because, like I showed you on that video, when you applinate with a flat system, especially. In, even if you do it in a non-cone, I can tell you, you get those, you get those waves in basically the decimates. And you can imagine if you're going to try to cut a four millimeter circle, you're going to have to get it pretty accurate with respect to understanding the undulations. And you've got to also bear in mind that your OCT is only taken in two planes. So it's not a 360 degree OCT image that you're basically looking at. So they have a system that you can cut a PK, so a vertical cut with a liquid applicator. So I used it for an example in a patient so this is a woman who had a herpes simplex scar and we did a, I did a dog for her and her vision went from 624 to about 612. But as you know, because when you do these, sometimes you do these dogs and these herpes simplex scars, they have ridges and folds and decimates membrane. So I got down to about 75, 80 microns dissection by hand. And then I left it, I put a cornea on and then we basically we left it. So she was okay. She got about 624, 618 with, her, um, with a contact lens but you could still see these folds there. So what we did was, is that we went back and then we used the liquid applinator with the uh, femtosecond laser on the Z8 and I cut the decimate membrane from the inside and then I did a DMEC for her. Uh -huh. So I think that that's, so I, I actually, I'm not even sure how you'd even do this without a laser because trying to cut around that whole area, you'd have to guess, but because we can use the intro, so I was using the interoperative OCT from the cataract to give me the idea of the basically the depth on how much to basically cut. So I think that all these applications, they're there. And I mean, just as opposed to doing using a standard PK, you can do it for much more interesting kind of surgery that we're sort of dealing with, with all these lamellas and stuff. 
Yeah, and so uh, springing from that comment, uh, do you have you done any work, or do you see a role lasers uh, have roles for these lasers to play in doing non-circular graft cuts? Yeah, so I mean, you you can certainly you can alter the shape. I mean, it's program it's 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 um, programmable to basically. Um, the shapes that you want as well. So you can make it into an oval basically shape. The issue would come is that of course, you're gonna probably do that mainly for anti lamello as opposed to for, for PK. I think that the big, the excite, the thing will be, the next phase will be is that we switch from the um, lamella software, which I showed you, which just came out only a couple of years ago from a flat alternator, but doing this with a liquid. To me, that'll be a really interesting thing as well. And the other interesting thing that will be coming out soon as well is linking this to topography. So you can get a topography and then you can link your preoperative topography to your femtosecond laser. And certainly that will be available, probably it's already available on the screen now on the screen femto. And you can do it basically probably be available on the Z8 as well, where you can link the two things together. But that'll be quite an interesting thing as well. Um, and we just uh, have heard of the Schwinn and uh, C Martha Schwinn Femto. We don't have it available here. Uh, any comments on the uh, lenticle systems that say compared to what we know more as the Zeiss system? Yeah. So, there are two, so there are two laser systems that have the CE mark. So one is the Z8 and one is the Atos, which is the Schwinn system. Um, they, they call it, I mean, they don't call it smart because of proprietary use, they call it smart sight and Zima call it clear um, for the, for, uh, the lenticular extraction. But essentially it's a lenticular extraction procedure. I mean, I think that we're seeing that, you know, when we started doing smart back in 2011, it, it was a, what you consider almost first generation now, right? So we know some of the issues, we know the issues with centration, we know the issues can be with suction and stuff. And these newer lasers try to get around that system. So both the Schwind and the Z8 allow you to move the lenticule across the screen after docking. So after you do your docking, you can actually move the lenticule into position. So this will help you with your cyclo torsion and also with getting it on directly on the visual axis itself, which can be a little bit tricky with the visual back system, which you have to do that manually as well. So these are the things I think with the new laser system and the other two systems, I mean, there's one by Alcon, there's one by J&J as well, um, where supposedly also you can do a lot of these with these newer systems as well. So these, I think, will really push the field forward in what we're going to be able to do with the lenticles and what kind of shapes we can cut in the cornea. Okay. Well, it's um, 8.05 now. Um, I think we could kind of just pick your mind for like a long time, but with respect to uh, uh, time and and I know it's evening there for you. Uh, you finished clinic. So thank you so much, Joe, for your time. It's been really, really interesting. Good to see you. Hope to see yeah. you in person soon. And again, thanks for your time. And uh, the, I'll let you know when the recording will be up uh, on our YouTube channel. No problem. Okay. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.